there's so much, there's so many political elements to this, you know, so you have people, people, you know, people on the far right are saying drill, baby, drill. And you have people on the far left that say, shut it all off, you know, and at the end of the day, what people don't understand is that we absolutely, as the governor said, we need an all and above strategy. Yeah. Hey y'all, welcome to the Texas Forward podcast. This conversation was in the beginning of March when we had the opportunity to join Katie Menhart, CEO of Ally Energy at her fifth annual Workforce of the Future conference, as well as Forward Party co-chair, Governor Christine Todd Whitman. This is part two in our series. Along with serving as governor of New Jersey from 1994 to 2001, Governor Whitman was also the head of the EPA during the Bush administration. Katie was ambassador to the United States Department of Energy during the Trump administration, to the National Petroleum Council by the Biden administration, has testified before Congress on the clean energy workforce of the future. She is globally recognized as an author and a speaker. Both Governor Whitman and Katie are deeply knowledgeable about the energy sector and share their insights on current and future job opportunities in clean tech, how the U.S. can overcome competition from China to lead the world in green energy and how the recent legislation in the Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure Bill will impact the American economy. Because we are a bit of a traveling podcast and this was filmed after lunch, you can hear a bit of background noise, but it shouldn't be too distracting. It's just the wonderful staff at the convention center cleaning up. And with that, we hope you enjoy and don't forget to like and subscribe. Well, I am here with Katie Maynard and Governor Christine Todd Whitman. You both have had a pretty long day, I would say. (laughs) Well, Katie certainly has. She's been the one that's been organizing this incredible conference for women and energy and just moving forward with energy. Absolutely. Katie, yeah, this has been terrific. So we're at the fifth an- fifth annual yeah. Ally Energy Workforce of the Future Conference here at the Petroleum Club in Houston. And uh, yeah, I would love to just give you one more one more uh, thing on the to-do list here before, before the day goes on to the next. I'm sure you've got plenty actually planned after this. Yeah, we've got a lot of fun the rest of the day and tomorrow. Really, the whole week, it's a great week for energy uh, here in Houston where leaders converge and talk about policy and talk about the future of energy. And we wanted to talk about the workforce since that's about jobs. Katie, you're, you're, I love the uh, the nickname, the goddess of energy that you were <laughs> given today. I think that's very appropriate. Um, it's, a, it's look, I I never thought I'd set out to, to create – don't step into these shoes thinking you're going to create something, but it's been really neat the last eight years trying to get more women and marginalized communities involved in energy because energy is the currency of life. Yeah. And it's huge when it comes to jobs, particularly here in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. So basically the format I would like to, to take with you both here today is just ask a couple of questions. Have you both kind of give a short answer and then have some conversation about it. So on that subject, jobs obviously is the main theme of the conference. What, and we'll start with you, Katie, what, um, what clean tech do you think holds the biggest promise in job creation? And on the flip side, Texas being a huge, the biggest oil and gas producer in the country, what can be done at a federal level as we transition away from um, you know, oil and gas more, more towards those new clean tech? Yeah. So first and foremost, I, I think an adjacent industry to to oil and gas, it's a natural fit is hydrogen. You hear a lot of talk about hydrogen, the infrastructure that exists already here in Houston, Texas and across the state, I think is going to be big. But I also have been proponent of wind and solar. Wind and solar are huge. We have big uh, uh, installments and projects across the state of Texas, actually, in the last uh, uh, election, presidential election made sure that I told everyone that, you know, Texas is not just about oil and gas. Texas is about um, 
you know, uh, other technologies. And it's exciting because here in Houston, we are really doing a lot. The mayor of Houston, uh, Mayor Turner, uh, has done a lot to bring industry and government and academia together to really think about what does the future look like for energy. Uh, but there's been a lot of talk and a lot of investment on hydrogen, hydrogen hub projects, uh, as well as wind and solar. Excellent. Governor? Well, I mean, Katie's the expert here on what is happening here in Texas, but it's happening across the country. And I am also one that thinks that there are a lot of job opportunities that could be had in the small modular nuclear reactor sector as well as a transition to the point where we get to be able to rely on the wind and solar and hydro and any other, so, well, I don't think we're, hydropower is gonna be part of the future given the problems with climate change and water. And yeah. we just don't have the water to produce the power anymore. We can't, we can't be doing, relying on that, I don't believe. But hydrogen is certainly their fusion now is finally, they're, they're holding that power for a little longer. It's no longer 25 years in the future, it may be 10 years in the future. And when I was, grew up, it was always going to be, well, 25 years, we're going to have fusion, 25 years. Well, now it's down to 10, so that's a, that's a good sign. There's a lot of exciting things going on, on, not just on the development of new resources, but also on how we uh, can do better by uh, ensuring that we're wasting less, that we're capturing carbon, that we're capturing hydrogen. Um, we're, it's the kind of thing that offers the potential for lots thousands of new jobs on each in each one of these, whether it is bringing home here the production, for instance, on nuclear, the rest of the world is building nuclear. We're never going to build another big nuclear reactor in this country, but the rest of the world is. Well, we could be producing stuff for them. If we're not going to do it, that's fine, but we could be creating jobs here for others. But I want the jobs to be here. Yeah. Um, if the product ends up going overseas, so be it. But I also think that for us and in, in rural communities, particularly, SMRs could be a, a very good answer to that. The other thing that you have to think about with energy, where again, there'll be a lot of jobs needed, is in the infrastructure itself. Because a lot of where the wind power and solar power is being developed are in remote areas that not, aren't necessarily on the, on the pipelines right now. And the infrastructure is vulnerable. We need to ensure we harden that, and we're going to have to build more uh, transmission lines to get to where the power is being developed. So all of those things mean that there's a potential for a huge number of new jobs. And I think what Katie was doing with this conference was particularly emphasizing the point that women and minorities have huge opportunities here and should be encouraged and included in this, and it will make an enormous difference. Yeah, no, the only thing I would add to, the, to uh, what the governor said is uh, it's an exciting time. There's a lot of uh, capital coming from the private markets, from the public markets, and obviously from the federal government. I was really excited that Joe Biden reestablished the Paris Accord when he came mm -hmm. into office. I think that was yep. a very smart move. Um, I don't always agree with what the president has done around energy, yeah. but I think that we've reestablished ourselves as a leader in energy with this uh, bipartisan infrastructure law as well as the IRA. The oil and gas industry absolutely stands to gain from this. Uh, a number of people across the industry that are very familiar with this understand that, that the times are changing and that businesses are shifting. We're still going to need oil and gas to, to run our country and run the infrastructure we have. But we also have a huge opportunity to bring on stream new technology that will drive innovation and obviously that will drive more jobs. I don't think there's a major utility that I know of that doesn't have a pretty broad diversified portfolio that aren't doing so, don't have investments in solar and nuclear and forms of green power. I mean, we're going to need everything yep. yeah. for, for quite a while. I mean, yes, we want to do everything we can as as reasonably as we can to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. But we're gonna to have to have fossil fuels. If they're not, we can't just snap our fingers and they're gonna go away overnight. There's still a lot of challenges with the renewables to get them to be base power. Because right now they really are just shave, peak shaving. And we like, we're a 24 seven society. Right, we, we like our AC. Right. We like well, you don't like the AC as much. You, you <laughs> said it was cold in here earlier. I like to crank the AC personally. <laughs> Me too. But you know, 
know, it's interesting we, you, we are talking about this because if I think about it, like this is such a politicized topic, like many things are in our nation. But energy is, is there's so much, there's so many political elements to this, you know, so you have people, people, you know, people on the far right are saying drill, baby, drill. And you have people on the far left that say, shut it all off. You know, and at the end of the day, what people don't understand is that we absolutely, as the governor said, we need an all and above strategy. Yeah. If this country is going to continue to flourish and continue to lead, we need to be looking at all avenues for possibilities. I mean, when Energy 1.0 was built, the wildcatters of Texas founded that here. And the wildcatters of Energy 2.0 will find that those, those solutions here. And that was what was neat to see today was to hear from some of these new and innovative companies and people who actually worked in oil and gas and mm -hmm. made the transition right into these new companies. And it doesn't mean that we're going to you know, push things away. It means that there's huge opportunities for both kinds of companies. I think we heard that it's going to take an ecosystem of people. It's going to take lots of partnership. And I think that's what I love about Forward is that we're not looking at polar opposites. We're looking yeah. at how do we drive some sensible solutions forward. Yeah, it seems like such an opportunity for forward. You know, I think it's, and you guys could speak to this as well. I, I feel like the right has somewhat come to the table a little more in acknowledging that climate change exists. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. in, at least they're recent. saying it exists. They're not <laughs> uh, sort of. Well, yeah, like, sort of, right. It's, so it's very hard to deny that Mother Nature's just not really happy with us right now and is letting us know it. Uh, because we've seen what happened, what's happened across this country is still happening with weather changes, which are climate related. I mean, yes, they are the immediate uh, weather issues, but they're, they're part of a long-term trend that we're seeing and people are starting to recognize that. It's costing us billions and billions of dollars to recover from these storms. Yeah. Each one of them is over a billion dollars in recovery and some of them far more than that. So there's a real hit to our bottom line, as it were, we need to take these things seriously, and that's why we have to stop politicizing every issue that we have in front of us. We have to start thinking about the yeah. policy, and I'm convinced you get people in the room who disagree on a topic, but you sit them down and say, do you think this is a problem? And if they say yes, then, they, then they're willing to engage in a discussion of how do you solve it, and that's what we're trying to do with Forward is create that space where people can come. Forward Party will allow people to come together to do that and be responsive to the local issues. Um, you know, what matters here? Because the way Texas goes, approaches energy and where its reliance on energy is, is gonna be different than where it is in, what it is in Maine. Yeah. Um, and we need to recognize, and frankly, I think we, we need to uh, be thankful for the differences we have in this country because it all melds together at the end and makes us as strong as we are because we are as diverse as we are, frankly. Absolutely. You talked a little bit, both of you talked a little bit about the, you know, the need from a budgetary standpoint and just, it's, it's bigger than just the political divisions when it comes to energy, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've heard constantly is that this is a big problem for us internationally. And Katie, you touched on this today right out of the gate, which was, if we're not doing it, China would love to be the leader in renewable energy, clean technology, they see that opportunity. Um, do, you, do you think China is outpacing us right now? And if so, how do we catch up? Well, so the way I look at this is, there's kind of two ways I look at this. The first thing is, is um, this is the greatest country. Um, I, I also believe though that we are, um, the, that this country cannot be, um, too, uh, too proud. We need to realize that there are other nations and that nations rise and fall. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at history, there, there are a lot of times in the period of history that, you know, point to uh, cases where, you know, nations have, um, because of their division, you know, couldn't get along, right, that we've, we've seen collapse. I'm not saying that's going to happen in the United States, but I think energy is one of those cases where we can rally around the fact that this is something we need, we need more of, and we need to accelerate our leadership role um, on the world stage. It was not until the IRA, you know, the State Department and others that I've talked to, the Department of Energy, um, you know, said that 
on the world stage, you know, prior to this, we were not, the U.S. was not seen in this space. Sure. Um, and, you know, I, I, my belief on China is that the Chinese want to outpace us on everything. Uh, of course. You know, and, and so we can bicker and, 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 you know, have these differences while the rest of the world moves on or we can lead. And I truly believe that, like I said, the oil and gas companies, the, the workforce that has been here to develop energy can absolutely develop the energy of the future. And the renewables industry has told me multiple times, we don't have enough people. Right, so we're going to have to do something. In fact, if we're going to if we're going to do anything, we've now we've now got a war for talent and innovation outside of energy. So we're going to have to get more people from the outside. I actually wholeheartedly believe that we're going to have to look at immigration because we don't have enough mm -hmm. talent in this country, mm -hmm. right? And so, in order to get those dollars, in order to get that investment back here in the U.S., it's a it's a completely different um, you know paradigm shift. I will say the second thing is is that China is the number one emitter. Okay. Yeah. It actually has, you know, the largest um, the footprint of all the countries, and it has the most to, they have the most to gain if they were to right convert from coal plants to you know new energy plants. So I think that what we're going to see is will be interesting to see kind of the the race on clean energy. But I have to believe you know I lived in this country. I was born in this country. I was you know born to be proud you know of the Absolutely. things that we've done here. But we absolutely have comp competition from the outside, and we should definitely take that as a sign that we need to pick up the pace here in the U.S. Definitely, and I would absolutely. say no country has been is more entrepreneurial or more efficient and productive than this country when we put our minds to it. But as Katie said, we've got to make up our minds that this is a serious issue. We can do this. We can do this better than anybody if we really put our minds to it. Absolutely. But that means agree. it's going to take uh, government support at all levels. Because the transition isn't going to be easy. And there are a lot of people who, you're not going to take a 45-year-old coal miner and turn him into a high-tech person. It's just not going to happen. But what you ha So what you have to do is look at the area where they are, see what government incentives at the state or local or federal uh, government can put in place to encourage the companies that are going to be using this to manufacture in those areas where people have, are going to lose mm. the jobs in the coal mines because they can build, they can manufacture better than anybody. We do it better than anybody, and they can do that work because you have to take care of those communities as well. You can't yeah. just leave those people behind and say, mm, sorry, we're moving on to a new generation of energy, and so you were, tough luck. were cold, tough luck. Yeah. And I will say about China, um, they're also building nuclear reactors. I mean, they rely heavily on coal, but they're also building nuclear as well as providing the rest of the world with a lot of the, of the uh, solar panels and the rare earth minerals. Fortunately, we now have just joined, well, the international community has come together with the Treaty of the Seas and Law of the Seas, and I hope we can, get, we can finally sign on to the Law of the Seas because one of the things that's happening with climate change is the Bering Straits are opening up, and that's where Russia is has int great interests, and China is starting to try to come over there as well as all the countries on around the Arctic Circle because there's a feeling that there are a lot of energy under the Bering Sea and a lot of rare earth minerals. And hmm. we're going to be competing with Denmark and all the rest of them, but if we're not part of the law of the sea, if not part of that treaty, we don't, really don't have a footing there because it's international waters. or We think it's our waters. And Canada thinks it's there. Denmark thinks it's theirs. The Russians are already sending submarines over. I mean, this is a worldwide competition. Yeah. And we need to be at the forefront of it. Well, and I tell people the war is not, should not be with each other. The war is on GHG emissions. Mm -hmm. You know, we really need to be focused. And I'm not an alarmist. In fact, I'm more of a conservative. And it does, I don't like big spending. I don't like big government spending. There are a lot of things I don't, you know, fundamentally like. When I look at what kind of investment we are making in America for my daughter and for her generation, the next, my, my granddaughter's or my grandson's generation, right, whenever I have those grandchildren, it excites me because we are finally shoring up manufacturing, better service, right, in this country. We've Absolutely. done way too much to, sh to send all of our business overseas, and while that did maybe make sense, it does not make sense anymore, and energy is going to be uh, fundamental the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I, um, you, you, 
so Katie, you touched on, there's a few things I wanted to follow up with actually each of you on that you, that you just said there. So Katie, you said there's, there's, so there's not enough people. There's not enough people in the workforce. Mm -hmm. I think you both mentioned that. Um, where is the overlap? So the manufacturing you mentioned, do you feel like that is probably like the closest thing? Let's say if we shut down Texas specifically, like an oil and gas, uh, oil and gas economy lost a bunch of jobs or a coal mining company lost a bunch of jobs. Is manufacturing, is that the closest thing or where else can we potentially help those workers to pivot to? Well, I think the pivot's going to be, and it's already happening, is in, you know, carbon capture and storage, mm -hmm. hydrogen. Uh, we heard from two amazing startups that are taking, you know, waste and making it into product. That's, that's amazing. We had a, we had a, a high school senior who who put a, a, a gap into the room about, you know, what are we going to do when, uh, you know, all these batteries, right, need to be recycled and whatnot. Yeah. And someone said, we don't know, but that's a great idea. Go start a business. I think you're going to see a resurgence of entrepreneurship in this country. And as, as the governor said, there's no better place to open a business, run a business, be entrepreneurial than in the United States. So I look at this as a huge opportunity. It just means that we're all going to have to make different choices it also means that there are going to be available jobs where we may not have skills, right, for those jobs. I had to make a decision several years back myself. I decided to leave, you know, my industry to do something different, to try and solve this problem around the workforce. Sure. So I think there's a whole bunch of opportunity. We have to look at it as a, a both and and not an either or mm -hmm. situation. Um, we still absolutely <laughs> fundamentally need fossil fuels. I mean, when you look at what happened just a year ago, uh, you know, with the war, the supply situation, um, we don't need to be in a situation where we don't have enough supply, right? Because there's shortages due to, you know, conflicts. Sure. So it's, it's important for us to establish, obviously, that, you know, we need new technology, but also to, and, uh, also to, to remember that we're still going to need for the near future fossil fuels as a part of our our daily lives. We just have to look at how we use energy, the use cases for energy, the best use cases and the most efficient use mm. cases for energy. Excellent. And Governor, the, the thing that you mentioned that I, I found fascinating, um, and I'm curious to hear your take on this as well, is so the rare earth minerals, um, it's my understanding China produces a significant right. portion of that. We don't hardly do any if we do any at all and i this is the first time hearing about this um it was the, the law law, law of, the, of the sea law of the sea so that seems like that's imperative for us to win that if we want to protect ourselves. you know doesn't the fact that china produces this outsized portion of these rare earth minerals doesn't that open us up to a tremendous security risk. If, if oh, we're absolutely. On I mean, there's no question about it. And, and also, you could see what happened in Europe with the war in Ukraine and the way Russia, even before the war in Ukraine, was using energy as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have learned, and are, it's amazing how quickly actually the Germans have been pivoting to get away from their reliance on the Russian oil. And all of Europe is going to have to do that. And they did it through a very cold winter for them. We may have had a milder winter, except in California, but <laughs> where they're getting inundated yet again uh, by Mother Nature. Uh, it's, um, it shows you that you, you need to have a diversified portfolio. There's just no question about it. Yeah. The real challenge is what actually Katie was doing today, which is the job force, is getting people, young people particularly, to look on the field of energy. First of all, to understand how very broad that is when you say energy. Uh, they think of it as, oh, I've got to be a coal miner, or, mm -hmm. oh, I've got to be a, a high-tech person, but that's not me. No, there are all kinds of jobs in energy uh, that are required in the energy field. It's extremely broad. And we need to do better with our STEM education to give them a broader background. But they need to know how to communicate. They need how to know how to be able to express their ideas if they want to be an entrepreneur, 
how to express their ideas for the new companies that they want to create, because the ideas that we heard today that I think we're all hearing almost every day, it's, it's exciting right now, all the new things that are, that are coming forward, the ideas people have for capturing emissions and for ensuring that we are doing the very best we can and that we do are doing recycling. There's a company in New Jersey called TerraCycle that started by a, a Princeton student who, now why you ever got to this place in the first place, I don't know, but decided to that worm poop would make a very good fertilizer. And he liquefied it oh. and he figured out how to do it and that's gone now. He, they, TerraCycle, recycles everything that other people don't. I mean, they will recycle batteries, they recycle toothpaste tubes and, and things that have a uh, different uh, variety of, of things in them. Uh, and this is just one person starting a national, now he has a worldwide business. That's, that's the kind of thing we do so well in America. But we do need to reach down. I, I mean, I'm all for a broad education. I want kids to learn how to write, learn how to speak, learn how to read, learn how to do some of the things yeah. that are not being taught now. Um, they also need to have classes on uh, civics. That would be a good thing, too, so that they know what they, their responsibilities are in our democracy. But we need to under, help them understand that there are enormous possibilities in this field. Having said that, almost every field nowadays has that help wanted sign out. Oh, yeah. And we have to take a good hard look at our workforce and what do we need to do is it training that they need? What what is it that we need to do to get get more people, to, young people particularly, to to understand their opportunities and take advantage of them? Yeah, absolutely. So, with one of the one of the hot button debates with um, clean energy, I think just in general with the left and the right in our current political environment is you look at. Most Americans can't afford to buy a Tesla. They can't afford to put solar panels on their roof and resell the energy that they get from, from solar as much as maybe they even want to do that. Um, I, I would love to put solar panels on my roof. They're expensive, you know? Um, so emissions goals, those are all well and good, but how can we, from a policy standpoint, what policies can we enact? And maybe have we enacted or are we enacting that can make clean tech more affordable um, as opposed to just giving, you know, Americans who are already financially strapped another, you know, expense. Well, the governments, I mean, a lot of governments now, state governments particularly, are offering programs to help people be able to put solar panels on their sure. roofs and things. Uh, also, to the extent that they're investing in alternate technologies, that will help diversify and help reduce some costs. I think they're very, very focused on that. Obviously, we have programs, certainly uh, we rely on it fairly heavily in the Northeast, programs to help people during the winter with their, when they can't afford their energy costs, to help them with their energy costs. You don't want people freezing in their homes or their apartments. So yeah. there are a lot of programs already out there to, to help people with that. And we need to keep, uh, we need to keep a, a good weather eye on it to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. Uh, but I would love to have the private sector doing even more because I, too, like Katie, I don't want government and everything. And, yeah. And we need to be able to uh, ensure that we, those of us in the private sector or the, the semi-public sector, are encouraging the kind of support that people require in order to be able to afford their electricity. You shouldn't be having to make the decision of, do I heat my home or do I pay for my drugs? That's just not a, an acceptable choice. Those aren't acceptable choices. And so we need to look at where we best spend the money that we have and do it the mo most efficient way possible. We're not always terribly good at that when they're big government programs. They sure. tend to sometimes go a little awry, shall we say. Um, but uh, we can do better and we need to do better. But we also need to understand there is a role for government and it'll have to play that role. We just want to play, have it play that role as well as it possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I really like about what the, the Department of Energy is doing right now, and so it's interesting because under the Trump administration, I got a call during uh, the pandemic, would you serve as an ambassador? And I said, 
what does that mean? Make sure that it's just not a title kind of thing I, I want to do, right? Sure. And then not too long ago, I was asked to sit on the National Petroleum Council advising Secretary Greenholm. And as I've really had a chance to get closer to government, because let me just tell you, I've had my head in the sand for at least the last eight years. So all the last two or three elections in my adult life, I've just, I don't want to vote. You know, I'm, I was kind of done, you know, I was spent. But the more I got, actually I got closer to government and, and more interested in government and policy when I started in these roles, you know, as, 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 as you know, serving the country in DOE. And what I actually love about what they're doing right now is they're hiring people who worked in energy or in industry to help dole out the money. So the people mm. who are helping the government, right, make specific choices around commercial risk. That's great. Loans, right? These are not bureaucrats that are making these decisions. Although everyone thinks that because you're in Washington, you're a bureaucrat. And there are a lot of bureaucrats in Washington. Let's get, let's get that right. Yeah. So it's actually gotten me excited because... I've been talking to all of my friends who, you know, are a little, you know, later in life in terms of their careers. I'm like, run for office. Why don't you? You know, go run for railroad commission, even though in the state of Texas we don't have railroads to commission. We have energy, right? Yeah, but they rail. control land. That exactly. railroad commission is about the most powerful thing here. Right, right. So what could we do to get more people who have practical knowledge, right, of the topic that we're talking about? to get into government to help shape policy. I don't think that we can shape policy from the outside. I think right now it's about the insider's game. Of course, Forward's trying to change that. Mm. I want to see more, obviously, I want to see more diversity in government, but I really want to see more commercial heads who can look at this from a business case perspective. Look, we've got a half a trillion dollars that has been allocated and earmarked by Congress with this, with this you know, bipartisan um, infrastructure law and you know, the, um, the IRA, it's good to know that there are business people in Washington, yeah. right, that are starting to, to move this, this money out. So, you know, I absolutely can't stand big spending. It's not, you know, something I've ever been fundamentally for. But when I look at the opportunity that this creates, I think it's an important thing for us to do. And I tr have to trust that the people that we're putting into these roles to make these decisions are going to make the best decisions for stewarding of, of public money. So. That was something that we were always very careful of doing at EPA when we had our new regulation proposed and we had an advisory committee. I always ensured that there was someone from the industry that was being impacted on that advisory board. And um, a, yeah, lot of the, that today. a lot of the environmentalists weren't happy with that, but I said, nobody knows more about that industry on the ground than they do. They have a right to be heard. It may not be their position that we take at the end of the day, or but it, it, we probably will reform our regulation to make it a little easier for them to comply or change it entirely. You, don't, you just don't know. And when we worked on the uh, Hudson River and cleaning it up, one of the things I, I said was we were going to put a six months test period. We were going to clean it up the way we thought it needed to be cleaned up, and GE was going to pay for it. We got them to agree to that. But in six months, we're going to take a look and see how it's working. And again, um, there was a lot of pushback. It was just a way to let the companies out from under it. We did look at six months and found out that what looked good in the lab, with I mean, there was no bias or prejudice in the EPA labs. Sure. But they weren't in the field. And what looked good in the lab was actually the way we were t cleaning up the river was releasing more pollutants than we were taking out. So when they went back to the drawing boards, came up with another process, and now it's working perfectly. But you have to be willing to look at yourself again. You have to put people who are the most directly impacted, who have a knowledge of the area, help make the decisions, help craft. Not Again, not turn it all over to them. I've seen that happen, too. Right. Both sides, uh, either side, both sides, all sides, uh, doing it. But they need to be there to say what's real and what can really be accomplished, um, not what just looks good in the office. If you don't ever have to manage anything, you don't have a clue. Yeah. Um, and that's why there's, there's such a difference between an executive branch and the legislative branch, because the departments and, the, and even they, they have to make things happen. 
And that's different than just thinking, this is a great idea, we're going to make a law that says you have to do this. Well, that's Yeah, great. and I'm starting yeah. to appreciate civics in action, honestly, <laughs> as a 47-year-old woman, because just seeing it in action, being a part of the Department of Energy, learning more about the State Department and like what it does. And that it is the departments where the action is taken. It's just making sure that we have good, sound, or diverse group of people, right, helping to guide and steer the monies that have been allocated. So I'm very, I'm optimistic about this. I really am. I have to be um, because my kids counting on me, you know, yeah. and that's what gets me up every day. I mean, but if you'd asked me, you know, two, three years ago, well before I even got the phone call, would you be like a private sector ambassador? I was like, I want nothing to do with government. I absolutely can't stand vote, like voting on voting day because I have such a hard time, you know, making those decisions given the candidates that are put forward. So. But that's because so many people said, I'm not going to vote in the primary because I can't be bothered and I don't know people and it's a sunny day or it's a rainy day. Exactly. And I'm not going to go to the polls. And so that was the most devoted people were the ones who got there and they yeah. tended to be on the extremes in both parties. And then you had, you came to the general elections, you got pox on both your houses. I don't like either candidate. Yep. Well, <laughs> Guess what? That's not the solution. We, democracy doesn't ask a lot of us, but it does ask us to be informed and yes. to vote. Yes. And that's a very basic thing, and, and that's why we're so focused at Forward in opening that process so that everybody can feel that they're being heard, which you can do with the kind of changes we want to see. Absolutely. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that from so many people that I've talked to in Forward is boiling it down to that concept. People want to be heard and we're here to help people feel that way and get them excited again and not be disillusioned with the process so much that you don't want to, you know, don't think there's a point. Right. Which exactly. so many people which feel Which is like understandable that. in many cases. I and mean, you live in a district that's all red or all blue and you're the opposite. So why bother to go to the polls? Yeah. Nobody's going to Time to move. <laughs> no, Sorry. time to open the process. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. So, last question. Um, the grid, obviously, you know, our infrastructure um, in this country is on the decline. I think it's probably a pretty well-known fact, particularly in Texas. We've had a lot of issues with it. Um, so, how does the, you know, the billions of dollars, maybe trillions of dollars that have been allocated uh, through the IRA and the infrastructure bill, um, how does that impact the you know the improving our grid nationally and then here in Texas we have a very unique situation with ERCOT um, how does that kind of how do they come into play uh, for Texas and our grid here in Texas well so many years ago I'm actually sitting in a room I'm looking right at the old building where I started my energy career at Enron um, that's the building right there. I'm that? pointing to it. Yes. Wow. It's a little strange uh, to see it because I, have to take a I remember <laughs> walking, uh, being walked down uh, with uh, with my belongings because everyone had lost their job. You know, there was this brilliant idea twenty something years ago to deregulate Texas, and and actually, I was a big proponent for it because competition's a good thing. The thing is, though, is. The market rules were not set up, I think, right. I think that um, obviously with time, we've seen, um, you know, stagnation. We've also seen uh, challenges with keeping up with basics to, you know, shore up infrastructure and assets. And so when Winter Storm Uri hit, you know, in the middle of the pandemic and, and almost brought Texas to its knees, I mean, a multiple week type potentially month scenario when we had people die, right, because of lack of, of, of electricity, I think it woke people up to the fact that the regulators hadn't been regulating. They hadn't done enough, right, to keep the eyes on uh, what was needed. And so when I look at this situation, I think this is a huge opportunity. There's no excuse, right? No excuse why we can't shore up our grid. My understanding is not too long ago, the Railroad Commission wanted to wait to see what these funds were to make sure there weren't any loopholes. So instead of saying, thank you, Congress, yeah. thank you, American people, 
we will take this capital and we will deploy it in a way, right, that can help shore up our infrastructure, shore up the grid, make sure that everyone has reliable energy, give to companies, right, the need to, you know, um, harden their assets. Instead, it was, well, well, we'll take a look at it. And I thought to myself, that just says so much about how broken, you know, state politics is with, you know, the federal government. Mm -hmm. And we've got to stop this. We've just got to stop this. We've got to start working together. We've got to start investing. Nobody in this country likes to pay anything. We want everything on the cheap. We want, you know, everything here and now. And the challenge with that is at some point, there's a breaking point. And our infrastructure is at that breaking point. Same thing in California. You know, I feel sorry for PG&E. You know, PG&E has been, this is a utility has been, you know, has had fires. They've had all kinds of issues. There's all kinds of problems out in California with, you know, fires and yeah. things like that. They don't have any infrastructure. I mean, they have, when you are not paying for the cost to maintain or to improve or to enhance, right, the grid, What's going to happen with time? Well, it's just like a dam. It's like the dam on the west side of Houston that was supposed to protect my home and didn't, okay? Mm -hmm. And during Hurricane Harvey, they had to let the dam go into our backyard, right? We've got to make sure that in Texas and across this country, we are putting money to make sure that our infrastructure is shored up. You talked about water earlier. It scares me to death. Scares me to death to see what's happening with Lake Powell and mm -hmm. all this stuff out west. Oof, oof, just makes my, you know, makes me nervous. I'm seeing all these stories of things that they're finding that used to be at the bottom of lakes right. because, exactly. you know, the lakes are drying up. Yeah. And so where are we going to get, you know, water? I mean, you start looking at what is happening, this net effect here. And I know you asked about the grid and I'm going off on a different tangent, but you start looking at all these things, basics system's going to break. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We in this room are lucky. We're pretty privileged, I think. I'm looking at all of us. But the people that have barely the basics or even half the basics, how are they going to be impacted, right, by infrastructure um, degradation? So I could talk about this all day long. We've got to do more, and we should be taking these funds from the federal government, and should, we should be stimulating private investment from the private sector to continue to make sure that we've got the right infrastructure in place for, for our citizens. And the point is the money's yeah. there. It is there. The money is there, it needs to be spent in the way that's necessary. And it, it you know, I, I haven't been following what your railroad commission has been doing, but you want to say- Not a lot. What, <laughs> well, please tell me that you have a plan in place to use this money, because there's lots of money available to use it. It's up to you to use it right. We can, plug wells. We, yeah. can totally plug wells. we can plug wells. We can totally plug wells. We can plug wells. We can do all kinds you of projects. You can do all those things. And you ought to accept that money, say thank you, thank you for giving it to us, and we're going to use it now to ensure that we have hardened that infrastructure because the money is, it's in different pots, and there is a pot for infrastructure money, yeah. for infrastructure improvement, and that's what you, for infrastructure, that's what you take it for, that's what you use it for. And hardening infrastructure should also mean, because what worries me about the grid so much, <clears throat> Is, the, is just that, is the power supply to the grid, not just the pipes and things themselves. But if, if there's a, an attack, you could take down four or five, four or five places mm. where, you, where you have the major, uh, the major grids, and you could stop this country cold. Oh, yeah. You could stop. I mean, it, it's... Terrifying. That's something that's really got to be hardened. After 9-11, um, we went after the EPA, both the, the water and the, um, and the oil and gas, and, and the, excuse me, and the, and the gas, and um, chemical facilities. Water, right on board, hardened. They immediately, their, um, their group, their lobbying group, immediately set up new standards. They hardened themselves against... Uh, a, some kind of an attack where terrorists could get in and change by using the electricity change and the power structure change the uh, the way the chemicals are used to clean the water and really destroy people. I mean, literally, the chemical industry could not get them to go along. And we we even said we will take 
because there is a, a chemical institute, we'll take the, they, they stepped up and they, for their members, they set in a set of regulations of what they have to do to protect themselves. But there are a lot of chemical companies that are not part of their organization. We said, we'll take the rules that you have put in place for your own members and apply them to all the other companies that are not your members. So it's a level playing field. Right. It's got to be better for your members if everybody has to adhere to the same rules. Yeah. Uh -huh. Couldn't get them to do it. And you see the same thing in, in different telling. areas on energy itself um, and how they are, how far they're willing to go because they don't want government regulation. And so if they accept a little bit of it, does that mean they're going to be taken over? And please, God, you just have to make yourself safe so that we can be safe. Right. So with ERCOT, I mean, if, if Texas has this money sitting here, it's allocated to our infrastructure. ERCOT is a uh, private company. Are they going to be making a significant decision on if this is going to be used, like if we're going to be integrating green technology? No, I mean, I think a lot of... so. My knowledge of utilities is limited because it's been a while since I've worked across the street in sure. that big building. But um, but the way I see it, ERCOT manages the grid, and obviously the Railroad Commission manages oil and gas, which, again, I get back to, I don't know why the Railroad Commission, we, we can't change that to the Intercommission, Energy Commission or something, right? But when I talk to uh, private companies, the, the thing that I hear about, right now many of them are setting up shop in Washington and trying to find out what's available. So I see a lot of private, large, multinational companies, many of them who are sitting in the room here today, they want to be a part of, you know, the capital that's flowing out. So, yeah. you know, I think a lot of this is there needs to be communication and engagement between states, you know, and the, and the feds. And, and the feds have been coming to Texas quite a bit, particularly here in Houston, to see the kinds of innovations and things so i like to tell people i'm like you know if austin and the rest of the world don't want to participate fine here in houston we'll take the money happily because we have the workforce we have the technology we have the innovation we are the energy capital of the world and we will continue to remain the energy transition capital of the world love it i think that's probably a good place to end awesome. i really uh, appreciate you both taking some time this has been fun um Thanks to everybody listening at home. We want to hear your feedback on this podcast. We are a bottom-up party, and we like to think this is a bottom-up podcast. We want to get feedback from our listeners um, on our two incredible guests today and, and everything we've talked about and what you want to hear uh, for future episodes. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.